Welcome to the tutorial, everyone. Uh, this is tutorial on human activity recognition, and glad to have you all. Um, just to give you an introduction or overview of the tutorial, first of all, um, the tutorial is being organized by myself, uh, Greg Mori here, and Chris Kitani. Uh, unfortunately, Chris was not able to attend CBPI this year uh, due to his, um, I mean, he's visiting his family, I think. And instead, we have, we have uh, Nick Reinhardt, he's a LAM member, and Chris kind of explicitly mentioned that you can consider Nick as his avatar, so feel free to ask any kind of, you know, stressful questions. So, uh, this is the schedule. Um, I will have the, I mean, I'll try to describe more details about the schedule at the end of the introduction as well, but this is roughly the schedule. And what I particularly want to emphasize at this point is that we have two invited speakers, uh, Joao Kaira and um, Guna Sigurdsson. Sorry for the pronunciation. And um, Joao uh, will be particularly talking about um, the kine kine kinetics data set as well as uh, some of the, I mean, uh, some of his video CNN models like i3D. And Guna will also be talking about um, some of his data sets like Charaise and Charaise Ego, as well as some of the uh, convolutional neural network models. So, um, as mentioned, this is about human activity recognition. And it is computer vision area, of course, and it is about automated understanding of the videos. Um, the input usually is something like this, a continuous video stream. Sorry, I think the synchronization got messed up. Okay, better. So input is usually the video like this, um, and which is essentially a sequence of frames, and the objective is given such input uh, to produce uh, labels of events, particularly by humans uh, describing the video. So we not only want to know that there is a person one and there is a, ca a cat, uh, but we also want to know that the person one is approaching and petting the cat. Um, and, and as the video kind of continues, um, hello. And as the video continues, um, the person does. I mean, the person in the scene will do more activities, and we want to annotate such multiple activities in the scene, such as a person opening a trash bin. And uh, as the video continues like this. We want to be able to correctly annotate this is exactly, exactly the event that happened. And the person walked away. And we want, of course, automated algorithms doing this. So having such model uh, is our objective. And why are we interested in this? Well, there are multiple um, important societal applications, including um, annotation of web videos, for example, um, YouTube has more than 300 hours of videos being uploaded every minute, and it is impossible to, simply impossible, to manually annotate them. So we need activity recognition uh, for video indexing and retrieval. Another very well-known application is um, monitoring systems, such as surveillance. And in such cases, each camera obtains a um, real-time live video stream uh, in 24-7, and without human activity recognition, we are not able to make sense of any of these videos. And another thing I want to mention is that videos are not being available only from static cameras or movie scenes, but they are becoming available from dynamic moving cameras, like wearable cameras. Also, um, many robots are incre increasingly becoming available, and if we think about what the robot is obtaining from their camera, it's the video. In order to provide them activity or situation awareness so that they can intelligently operate and interact, we need to understand human activities. We need, to, uh, we need algorithms recognizing human activities. Why is it a difficult problem? Well, first of all, uh, there are too many variations. There are simply too many variations. Even if these two examples for, are here, uh, correspond to the same activity of hugging. Um, as you can see, there are, there are differences, too many differences. There is a viewpoint difference. There, there so, some of the videos have occlusion, some of them do not. Uh, they also correspond to non-rigid motion, meaning that there can be many motion style variations. And of course, clothing are different, and there are so many variations. Also, uh, very frequently, manual collection of training samples uh, is 
prohibited. Uh, we do know now that we need um, a good amount of training data to make our end-to-end -end representation learning models, like CNNs, um, really work. Uh, but for some activities, like stealing, um, occurrences of stealing actually is quite low. It should be low. Uh, and videos are very rare, but we still want to reliably recognize those important societal um, activities. And finally, um, action vocabulary is very often not well defined, such as a person opening an umbrella versus a person opening a door. Both of them are sometimes annotated as, as, as opening, and if you train a model that is that based on a person opening a door, and then you tell the model to recognize a person opening an umbrella, it's just, it is not transfer. So we need to somehow think about the transfer. And one more thing I want to mention is that there are different types or levels of activities. There can be gestures, a single body part movement. There can be actions, a single person multi body part movement. There can be human object interaction, such as a human interacting with a rocket and a ball. There can be interactions, two people interacting. And there can be group, inter group activities of a, a group of people trying to do something together. And the objective, of course, is to recognize all these different types of activities. Have a computational model that is able to ultimately handle everything. And now let us try to, I mean, I try to describe what human activity recognition is. And now let us try to formulate these, this human activity recognition a bit more technically uh, in, um, in terms of multiple problems. Probably the most well-known, most common um, problem is activity classification, which essentially is a video classification. It's a categorization of segmented videos. It's a supervised learning setting where input is a video segment containing only one activity. And based on the, uh, after training the model, uh, there will be new video provided, which is again a segmented video. The goal will be to categorize this video uh, into one of the known categories uh, following the supervised learning setup. Easy. Uh, and there are many existing public data sets uh, which are designed for such video classification, such as UCF 101, HMDB, as you see. The labels for these video clips are drinking and fall, I think. And there are other videos, I mean UCF, um, spinning, um, basketball. Uh, these are some of the very, very well-known data sets in, for activity classification. And Joao, um, during his invited talk, uh, will also mention uh, his uh, kinetics data set as well as the new kinetics 600 data set. Uh, in addition to just classification, there is also the problem of activity detection, particularly uh, temporarily localizing the activity. So in this particular problem, we have a streaming video, continuous video, and the objective is to find the starting time and ending time of such video. And you probably will be thinking that, okay, um, I annotated this as hugging, and you probably will be thinking that I am crazy to annotate this video as hugging. But actually, this is how a hugging looks like if you are a robot and somebody's hugging you. So um, robocentric perception that, um, just an example, and the objective is to correctly annotate starting and ending. And it sometimes is simplified as per frame annotations, but please note that the labels may overlap. There can be multiple things going on in the same frame. And there are multiple well-known data sets for this problem as well, including charades, which Guna probably will mention, uh, as well as multi -dumos. And one more thing to mention in this particular detection problem is that if we have a very good binary classifier, usually implemented in CNN, we are also able to apply that for the detection problem in very straightforward fashion. For example, if we have a classifier telling that this particular video segment is pushing, and telling that this particular video segment is not pushing, if we have something like that, we are able to apply such classifier in um, sliding window fashion, essentially trying to classify all possible temporal segments while controlling the duration of temporal segment. And at a certain point, uh, a classifier will say that there is pushing um, based on that uh, video segment, and then you'll be able to roughly know that the um, pushing is happening. And of course, this is not everything about activity detection, uh, so I will talk more about it when I uh, do my presentation. But um, 
I wanted to mention that it is extendable based on the classification. There also is the problem of spatial temporal detection. Uh, in this problem, we are also interested in spatially localizing where the actor is. Not just providing the time interval, uh, we are also interested in knowing uh, where the actor is in terms of usually bounding boxes uh, extended over a uh, temporal domain. Um, sometimes very frequently making them spatial temporal cuboid containing an action. And there can be multiple such cuboids in a video and we are interested in de detecting them. This is not exactly activity recognition, but this is also a very relevant problem, which is activity prediction and forecasting. Uh, if, we, if, we, if somebody says activity prediction or forecasting, there are usually two different meanings. One means that they want to do early recognition based on ongoing video. So think about a continuous video scenario where uh, somebody is trying to throw something, but the throwing uh, didn't happen yet. It is an ongoing observation. And instead of making the detector approach, approach try to apply the binary classifier for a um, given video segment, we want the ability for the classifier to be applied for the ongoing video uh, in incomplete obs observation. So this is sometimes what, we, what people mean by activity prediction. And sometimes uh, what people mean by activity forecasting is even more. Uh, it is about inferring future activities, locations, based on the current information. So given a current observation like this, uh, the objective is not just telling what is ongoing, but the objective is to actually forecast what is likely to happen in the next frame. So this is, um, on, um, one of, I mean, I talked about uh, multiple human activity recognition problems, which are all very important. And I just want to mention um, that there is a history behind human activity recognition. People were studying human activity recognition before CNN. Um, and um, for example, uh, this particular work, uh, one which, consider, which is considered as the very first action recognition work, uh, Yamato et al., they were actually trying to solve action classification um, following the exactly same action classification formulation as we did. I mean, as we are doing nowadays. The input is the segmented video of a human uh, playing tennis, tennis swings, and the, um, the goal was to, the categorization of the uh, various different types of swings, and the input was like 10 by 10, very low resolution pixel information. And they were even taking advantage of a sequential model called hidden Markov model, which is actually conceptually quite similar to recorded neural network nowadays. People looked at other problems. I mean, there are people looked at human human recognition of human human interactions. People looked at recognizing actions based on spatial temporal volumes, XYT volumes. Uh, they also looked at uh, taking advantage of 3D pose. They also uh, took advantage of optical flows um, in some of the approaches. And there was the uh, well known work of spatial temporal local features, which is conceptually analogous uh, to 3D XYT convolution nowadays in some sense. And there are um, hierarchical recognition works um, even before this. I mean, ever since early 2000, there were um, multiple works trying to address these different types of problems with a similar formulation, but they were lacking computational power, they were lacking data, so they, had, they were not using CNN, essentially. So, uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, conceptually compare what people have been traditionally doing and what people, are now, people nowadays are doing um, is, I mean, it is as follows. In traditional video classification, everything was about handcrafting a particular representation. We wanted to handcraft, it, handcraft a particular set of features, like um, histogram of optical flow, histogram of gradients, and then come up with a particular representation which can be um, a bit more high level, and then give it to a particular machine learning classifier classifying things. Nowadays, people are not handcrafting anything anymore. Um, people are just taking advantage of convolutional neural networks, which will be able to learn millions of internal parameters directly based on training data. I think you're all aware of this, but I just wanted to explicitly kind of confirm that um, Today, we want to do representation learning in end-to-end -end fashion rather than handcrafting anything, making everything more optimized for the data. And just to give you a bit more background about what video CNN models are popular, uh, particularly designed for video classification, 
Um, there are two major directions, as far as I understand. One is taking advantage of two stream CNN. Um, the other is taking advantage of 3D XYT CNN, um, or a combination of these two. And in both these cases, the input to the CNN is a fixed number of frames, such as a single frame in, um, in extreme case. It can be like 10 frames of optical flows, or it can be like 16 frames or 99 frames of um, a video chunk, video segment. Um, but it is fixed, and output is one single class label eventually. To describe a bit more about these two different directions, in two stream CNNs, they take advantage of two different types of inputs. One, raw RGB frame. The other, optical flows, actually concatenation of optical flows. And they have their own convolutional layers to process these two different types of uh, data stream. And they get merged at a certain point, um, essentially called fusion, or learning the representation. And then uh, they will be able to make a final decision, classification decision. Uh, in XYT, uh, 3D CNN, their approach is slightly different in a sense that uh, they want to learn XYT convolutional filters instead of 2D XY convolutional filters. So they, I mean, video is a 3D data in some sense. It's a sequence of images, so it's XYT data, not just XY data, and they want to fully utilize such property that video is XYT by learning 3D. And there are also there are also approaches taking advantage of sequential models like recurrent neural networks uh, to make a sequential decision, not just a single decision given a video, but uh, multiple decisions over time, and which has a better potential to be extended to temporal activity detection problem. So this is what people have been doing. So um, that's pretty much what I wanted to kind of introduce, and now we came back to this tutorial. Um, essentially um, re-describing what this tutorial is about. So we are particularly interested in not only the better models for video classification, but also really interested in what can we do further beyond classification. We have reliable, reasonably, um, convolutional neural network models which are able to handle segmented videos, make good representations, and make de uh, decisions. By taking advantage of such base CNNs, what further can we do beyond classification? For example, Greg will be talking about spatial temporal activity detection. I, after that, will be talking about um, taking advantage of temporal structure, temporal hierarchy in long continuous videos to make better decisions. And then we'll have invited talks by uh, Joao and Guna. Um, talking about their data sets, as well as uh, CNN models, as well as some of the interesting problems. And then Greg will talk about group activity recognition, which is far beyond just simple classification. And Nick uh, will be talking about activity forecasting. And finally, uh, we will be talking about emerging topics. I am particularly interested in talking about privacy in data for human activity recognition. And then we will be closing this um, tutorial sometime around 5 or 5. 5.10, I think. So we we'll try to be on time, and um, I am exactly on time, if you actually look at it. So uh, yeah, try to interrupt us um, if you have any questions or suggestions or comments. It's always interesting. All right. Okay, great. So thanks very much, Michael, for setting the, the context for what we'll talk about today. So as, as uh, promised, I'll talk a bit about spatiotemporal action localization. So I'm not sure if, if you have this problem, but you go to family gatherings and people ask you what it is that you do. And I say, oh yeah, I work on activity recognition. And sometimes you get blank looks and your, your grandfather, your uncle sort of says, what, what do you mean? What, what do you, what's this action, activity recognition business? And I say, you know, cat videos, right? We, we, we find cat videos. Okay, that's what we do. We often find cat videos. So I'm going to show you some cat videos. Um, so it's, it's activity recognition tutorial. Uh, that's it. Okay, so, you know, as you can see, there's this very primitive understanding that we're trying to, to achieve right now in, in activity recognition. It's um, 
all we're doing is putting a label on this video that says there is a jumping cat. And this is a very, very basic sort of thing. In this small segment of the tutorial today, I'm going to talk about going a little bit further, which is to put bounding box type representations that say, was the cat jumping like that? Was it jumping like this? Was it jumping up and down? Was there some time during the video it was jumping and a time during which it was not? Right? That's the type of representation that I'll be talking about in this, this portion of the, the tutorial. And if you think about motivation, why, why do I want to solve this? There, there, there are important reasons why I actually care about when and where people are doing activities. So if I take a surveillance video like this one, I'm looking at a crosswalk. I want to know which people are walking together. Were there people who crossed paths? Were there ones who came near cars that were in this intersection? I might want to measure things such as time to collision. Are there dangerous events that were likely to have taken place during this snippet of surveillance video? The person who's standing there, um, how long has he been standing there? What has he been doing? Has he interacted with any of the people? So these are more detailed understanding of where are the people, what are they doing, and for what duration have they been doing them. That's what we're, we're meaning when we talk about spatiotemporal action localization. So the typical sorts of representations that we, we use for this problem involve axis-aligned bounding box representations that are extended to 3D. So, so if I look at that, that video up there, this is a video of somebody kicking a ball. I might have a ground truth annotation that puts bounding boxes in each frame that say, where is the spatial extent of the person who is kicking the ball at that time? Right? And I have those on, on all of the frames in the video sequence. And again, sometimes this will persist over the entire video. Sometimes there will be moments of time where the person is kicking a ball and moments where the person is not. The performance measures that we use are typically intersection over union type measures. Right? So in each frame, we could measure the ground truth bounding box, which in this case is shown in red. How much IOU does that have with the prediction shown in blue? And we could do something such as average this over time. OK, so again, we're, we're in an activity recognition tutorial. And at this point, you might be sort of thinking, I've heard all of this stuff before. Sounds a lot like what happens in object recognition. All right. Um, instead of doing just recognition or image classification, I might do object detection. Um, I might take my images, put them through some anchor boxes, YOLO, faster RCN, etc. And so on um, the next slide, I'll show you the algorithm for doing activity recognition research. Here it is. So if you, if you so seriously, if you look at the, the, the literature, there is this, this phenomenon that um, activity recognition papers often are kind of very similar to papers that happened six months to a year ago, I guess maybe in archive time, now maybe it's two months or a month or a week or so, to something that happened in the object recognition literature uh, at the previous conference or the previous archive uploads. And so, so why is that the, the case? I mean, these problems are very, very closely related. I don't mean to, to say that we were sort of working in a, in a bubble that's separate from that. They are very closely related, but then there are some important challenges, right? So the new version of this paper that you're going to write needs to address some problems that are specific to activity recognition and action localization. So here's some examples of what, what I think are really important challenges that make activity recognition different from object recognition and things that people need to address in order to sort of bridge from ideas that are in object detection into successful activity recognition systems. So one of them is simultaneous actions. Um, right now I am standing, I am talking, I'm giving a lecture, I'm maybe gesturing with my hands. There are a lot of things that I'm doing that would all exist in this bounding box you put around me as a person right now. And again, some of those things are present in object detection challenges. You might have object parts, for example. You might have attributes. But these are very much fundamental to activity recognition. People can do more than one thing at one time, and they, they very often do. Whereas for a bounding box, often you say, that's a chair, and, and that is a chair. It's unlikely that you give many more labels to that thing in terms of the categorical side of which object is that. The other thing that's very difficult in activity recognition is delineating the begin and end points of activities. So again, in, in object detection, you can probably put a bounding box around an, an, an object. Maybe you want to do semantic segmentation and say which pixels are part of that object. But in, in time, especially, saying, you know, when did the speaking event start? When did it stop? Right? When did the lecture begin? When did it end? When did standing start? When did it end? When was I sitting? When was I running? These things are often very difficult, and they're often overlapping in time, and they're, they're difficult for humans to label. It's not simple to sort of annotate data with beginning and ending of actions. 
Aside from the fact that it's very expensive to do that, so we typically have less labeled data available because it's very time consuming to go off and label beginning and end points of actions and spatial extents of them. The other thing that, that's, that's very challenging is that the search space for activity detection, spatial temporal action localization, is much, much larger than that for object detection. So if you think about trying to build a, a YOLO type system or faster RCNN, extending that to video, you're faced with a problem of trying to come up with a set of you know, anchor boxes or proposals that are in a space that's the number of pixels, so width and height, to the power length of the sequence in time. And again, you've got this problem of starting and ending points being unclear, simultaneous actions be taking place. It's very, very difficult to imagine building a system that would propose with 100% recall all possible spatio-temporal bounding boxes for actions of people in a non-trivially length video sequence. And so that's, that's the sort of challenge you'd have to face. As opposed to in an image detecting objects, you again, you need to deal with some scales, you need to deal with some translations, but it's more feasible to imagine you can build systems that would propose all possible bounding boxes. Okay, so the third point that I have up there underneath search space is the difficulty in learning these things, especially when you talk about categories. So when you try to do object detection, you'll have sort of positive examples of objects and negative examples of objects. There will be intra-class variation, but in this case, most of what we're talking about is people. So we need to have a system that can reliably propose a region in space and time for a walking person, and at the same time sort of say this is different from a standing person. And again, given the vagaries of detecting things at the endpoints, it's very difficult to do that. And there are, of course, technical details as well about the, the compute resources you need to, to achieve this. Okay, so what have people done in the past to try to address this? One of the sort of seminal works in, in sort of um, modern sort of object uh, detection mapped to spatial temporal actual localizations worked by Georgia and Jatana Malik on basically running faster RCNN type detectors in frames of a video sequence, you know, doing a two stream sort of input where we have flow and appearance doing that independently in every single frame to get proposals around where they think people are, and then having heuristics that deal with that search space complexity. So they do proposals just in single frames, and then you have heuristics that link those together to form two bits, and then afterwards, again, you have um, separate methods that would classify those two bits according to what action is taking place. So in subsequent work, Peng and Schmidt sort of improved upon this by doing the kind of bounding box regression systems, where you would take in, again, RGB frames as well as perhaps a second stream of flows, and then do bounding box regression to sort of fine-tune where those, those action proposals should be with respect to that particular um, category. In follow-up work, this sort of the, the golden rule often of machine learning is end-to-end -end training. All of this stuff should be trained in an end-to-end -end fashion rather than having different separately trained modules that don't interact with each other. Um, recently, there's been a push toward doing that for spatial temporal action localization. And as you can imagine, it's very difficult to build frameworks that can handle arbitrarily length video sequences and be able to propose end-to-end -end trainable systems for both detecting in space in single frames, linking those over time. So one, one recent work by Saha et al., what they do is, and they said they do sort of microtubes. They say instead of going after entire long tubes that capture an entire action, you try to build microtubes that are short-term, end-to-end learnable um, tubelets that contain part of an action. And then again, you'll have to put those into some tube generation process that links those over time. Um, related to this again, we have some uh, recent work on doing this in a sort of a fashion that deals with this issue of standing people versus walking people. We built a method for doing generic action-independent tubelets. So these previous methods, basically, they look for tubes or microtubes or proposals that are specific to some action type, like a standing tubelet, kicking a ball tubelet, etc. We built ones that are sort of generic proposals that are about people, and then we can classify those using a more complex method that can look at an entire temporal extent when it comes to recognizing what action has taken place. On the side of sort of working on having uh, less supervision and trying to get away from having full bounding box supervision, some work by Metis et al. Uh, in ECC a couple of years ago was using point supervision only. So rather than assuming you have as ground truth bounding boxes for the person's action over time, you instead just have point supervision that says where was the center of mass of the person throughout this video sequence. So a cheaper sort of annotation to obtain. And again, you can build methods for building 
spatial temporal proposals on top of that by measuring affinity of some particular two-bit proposal to that um, point we supervise ground truth. Okay, so the other ingredient that you need in order to build uh, good spatial temporal action localization methods is data sets. And so some of the, the really still in use data sets around spatial temporal action localization are derived from uh, data sets on activity recognition that are from the sort of 2012, 2013 era. So the UCF series of data sets as well as the HMDB data sets have been sort of modified, often by augmenting them with additional labels that are about where and when people did actions in videos, and use those for measuring and developing methods for spatial temporal action localization. So what I would highlight on here is just look at the number of action categories that people are working on. Um, 10, 21, 24. And also the fact that many of these data sets are sort of trimmed videos. Right? So again, I think the, the, the goal in this field is to try to take in long, long videos, like those surveillance videos I mentioned, or sports videos, or you know, robot first-person videos, long-term videos, and spatial temporarily detect actions. And you can sort of see how these data sets are very far from this. They're generally working on trimmed videos. By trimmed, I mean that the kickball, the entire video clip is someone kicking a ball. I don't have to worry about what happened before or after. Generally speaking, the data sets are of this type, which is a very limiting assumption. Um, maybe the, mo the most recent and best data set, there's a, one out of Google from uh, uh, Chen Wei Gu et al. that was posted on archive last year called AVA, Atomic Visual Actions. This is probably the, the largest and, and best data set that we have right now as a community for doing spatial temporal action localization. They focus on atomic actions, so things like carrying, bending, these examples here are from working on a computer. They have 80 such atomic actions. They have 430 video clips, about 15 minutes in length each, and they annotate them spatiotemporally with where are the actions of people. Not all the annotations are available for training or for testing, and generally they use sort of middle frame annotations for evaluation. There's not sort of a full pipeline of spatiotemporal uh, localization going on. So you can see sort of, to me this is kind of an exciting area to work in because we're really, really far behind where we are in object detection. There's so many open issues that we don't know how to, how to address yet. And on the, the final sort of concluding slide, I'll sort of highlight a bunch of those that I think are important. Right? So label spaces, like what should we be recognizing? We don't yet have a good vocabulary of the things that we should go after in terms of spatial temporal action localization. The set of, of actions we have, again, many of those data sets are on the order of 10 to 15, and even AVA is still less than 100 different things that we know how to recognize. And that's a very primitive vocabulary in, if you talk about trying to understand human behavior. So again, there's a lot of open work that's possible in trying to develop new data sets that have better label spaces around what it is that we should try to localize in space and time. Another point, which I think you know, Michael's going to talk about next, is a lot about how do we localize complex actions. So how do we do things that are beyond just an atomic action, such as work on a computer or put, but actions or activities that persist over long amounts of time? And again, we don't have data sets that are about that, that are of the scale that we need to train high quality models that will be able to produce those on test videos. The other thing that, that's I think really a problem with current methods for spatial temporal action localization is this kind of um, use of tubelets and being ignorant of detection and tracking as a, as a field. Right, so, and you feel like from object detection, people have said, what we should do is take videos and then produce these axis-aligned tubelets. And each of those tubelets is going to have an action on it. And it doesn't necessarily feel like that's the right way to do action description, action localization. Why should we assume that there are these sort of begin and end points that are connected, which are this person during this time did walking. Right? Perhaps we should look at other mechanisms for either longer term things, um, presence or relationships between different aspects of human actions. There's a lot of open work on how should we actually represent spatial temporal action localization. Um, the other thing that we'll, again, we'll talk about in this tutorial quite a bit is on interactions between people, interactions between people and objects. How do those things relate to, again, this bounding box representation where I say, put something around the person irrespective of which objects that person's interacting with or which context they're in. So those are sort of things that we'll, we'll talk about in this tutorial as well. Okay, so the short conclusion to this segment is that 
for a large part, state-of-the-art systems for action localizations are derived from their corresponding counterparts in object detection. The important modifications that you need to make to them are a lot about trying to handle the large search space that you have in object detection. Multiple actions, temporal extent, and trying to make them end-to-end -end trainable, those are other things that you need to, to work on as well. Okay, so at that point, I'll conclude. If anybody has any questions at this point, I'd be, be happy to, to take them. So, yeah. yeah. so for me, it's kind of surprising that most of this activity is based on object detection rather, rather than uh, human pose estimation. Yeah, so I didn't I think kind of sort of, there, for, as Michael outlined in the, the beginning of this, this, in, this uh, tutorial, there are a lot of methods that use pose estimation as a feature for trying to do recognition. But it's absolutely what one can do is take the tubelet that you get out of one of those proposal methods, pipe it through a pose estimator, and use the sort of the 3D pose of the person as an additional feature to try to do recognition. So that, that's definitely something that's done, but I, I'm not sure, maybe your question is more towards why don't people use pose estimation or human detection as the precursor to all of this? And again, that's another good direction to, to go. There's definitely work on 3D action recognition that goes down that route as well. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thanks very much. All right, um, and I thank Greg for briefly um, introducing the problem of complex activity recognition, which is what I am going to talk uh, in this particular part of the tutorial. So this is a research direction about doing human activity recognition while also considering temporal hierarchy, while also learning temporal hierarchy in, or temporal structure uh, in activity videos. And this particular research direction is motivated by two uh, objectives. One objective is that we want to do activity detection, uh, temp uh, temporal activity detection from continuous videos. As we mentioned in the introduction, this is the problem of finding a starting and ending time, which can sometimes be uh, simplified as making per frame decisions. And um, this is one particular um, objective that's motivating this direction. Another objective is, as mentioned, we want to recognize complex human activities. We are not just interest, interested in atomic level actions, which, is very, which contains very consistent motion, but interested in doing something more than that. For example, uh, this is a particular video example from HMDB dataset. Uh, which was labeled as somersault, and even in this very simple activity, you can actually uh, find out there are two uh, very different uh, consistent motions. One is about rolling, and the other is about standing up. So the main idea is that if we have a convolutional model that is aware of these different types of two sub-events, and somehow represent these sub-events in videos um, separately, and then try to combine their representation for the final complex activity recognition, we can make a better decision. Instead of trying to mix all these motions, we, if we can nicely um, extract them separately and then do the recognition, it will be better. So uh, this entire, I mean, this part of the tutorial is about uh, describing the attempts to do it. And to be a bit more specific about what we want to do, we want to capture temporal structure in activity videos. This will include local temporal structure, uh, which is the sub-event uh, of atomic actions that I just described. Even in this very simple push-up activity, there are two salient atomic actions, such as a person going down and the person going up. So how can we take advantage of existing uh, base CNN models to ha reliably handle such compositional, uh, such complex activities having com uh, compositional nature, and do the, essentially do the better recognition. And of course, one more important thing is that these types of sub-events are very frequently uh, latent, hidden. What we mean by that is that we have no idea what the, sub, what the, what the optimal sub-event for a particular activity is. We just have the data, and we need to somehow figure that out. So we need to somehow figure out how to represent, and then how to represent activities based on such multiple sub-events. 
another challenge, another uh, objective is that we not only want to consider local temporal structure, but also continue, I mean, global temporal structure in continuous videos. If you look at real world videos, uh, there will be many activities happening in such continuous video, and they are correlated. And just simply considering like 10 frames of optical flow to make a decision is sometimes very insufficient. So the idea is somehow take advantage of global temporal context to make a better decision. So in order to tell that particular frame is about blocking, we want to also look at other frames uh, such as a person has to dribble and a player has to actually jump and shoot in order for the blocking to happen. I mean, blocking cannot happen without shooting. Pretty obvious. So we want to somehow take advantage of that. And this tutorial is about how, I mean, what are the attempts to do so. And just to mention before going in, um, there were other works, previous works not taking advantage of CNN, uh, which were still trying to consider uh, temporal structure in activities, um, including the works from 2010 and 13, as well as there are actually more works in early 2000 trying to address uh, the same problem. Their main limitations were, one, they were not learned in end-to-end -end fashion, meaning that their structure learning was not optimal with respect to the data. Uh, two, um, they were only for mainly focusing on segmented videos, mostly for the cl classification. And really handling long continuous videos in systematic formulation uh, has been limiting. So this is what people work on. And just to remind what people are doing with video CNNs nowadays, well, they have a convolutional model that looks like this. And I actually have to confess that these things actually perform better than these things even though they don't consider the structure, um, because the representation was more optimal for the data, since they were trained based on data. Uh, now, what I am talking is that, OK, we know that there are such good baseline CNNs. How can we extend this further to consider temporal structure like what they are doing and learn that in end-to-end -end fashion to make better decision? And here is one particular attempt. If you look at this, uh, you see the uh, sequence of frames. And this is not actually for continuous video. This is for still for the classification of segmented videos. But this is for the classification of videos with any duration. A video can be like 1,000 frames, 2,000, 100, doesn't matter. So in, and in order to make a better decision within such video, uh, the approach in this, particular, um, in this particular direction was to apply a baseline CNN that looks like this. Uh, two stream, i3D, whatever, for, e for every frame or every short video segment. And if we do that, we'll be able to convert the video into a sequence of a particular lower dimensional representation. I mean, usually like 4K vectors at, 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 the, at the end of um, the convolutional, last convolutional layer. And then what this was doing is that previously, if people had such videos, what they often did was just take the max pulling of all the representation along time axis and make a decision. Sometimes they didn't even do that. They actually sometimes just made per frame or per segment decisions and then try to combine them um, by simply um, averaging the decisions. Instead of doing that, uh, what this particular approach was about was learning to focus on particular sub intervals within the video. So instead of pulling uh, from max, doing the max pull, pulling from the entire interval, the idea was to do the pulling from multiple uh, short sub-intervals while learning where to focus on. And this actually was done uh, taking advantage of what we call temporal attention filters, which is nothing but a set of multiple Gaussian receptors. So these Gaussians um, applied uh, in temporal direction uh, can be viewed as learning filters for weighted pulling. So it decides what frame you want to capture the information from. And the good thing about this is that once you have something like this, then you can easily compute the representation by only looking at those Gaussian centers. Um, two, these um, locations actually are governed by really small number of parameters, which is actually the center of the Gaussian distributions the variance of each Gaussian distribution, and the stride, which is deciding the duration. So if we formulate it this way, these three parameters actually are fully differentiable, meaning that we can back propagate through these parameters to, make, to actually find out what are the 
um, most important sub-intervals within the video, the system or the model has to focus on to make an optimal direct decision. And the decision, as I mentioned, was um, the, just the class label, since this was for the classification. And this can be viewed as learning the pooling, learning the location, temporal location where to pull. And now you probably will be questioning, OK, uh, it sounds nice. Um, well, focusing on really learning to focus on certain parts should be beneficial. Does it really work or not? These are actually the example I showed you in the beginning.